Hey there, welcome to the Jeff and Heidi Show, where you're going to have the opportunity to listen to and learn from everyday entrepreneurs. All right, welcome to the Jeff and Heidi Show. I'm Jeff Hagee with Jeff Hagee Coaching. Unfortunately, Heidi Anderson is not with me today, but Heidi Anderson, ECI Secure Pay, is my co-host. And I'm excited today to have Jim Roddy with me. Um, he's an author, coach, uh, basketball player, so many things that we can go into. Um, but I'm actually going to turn it over to him a little bit and let him tell us a little bit of his bio. And then I'm just excited to get into this conversation. So go ahead, Jim, give yourself a little bit of an introduction. Great. Uh, Jeff, great to see you again. Great to talk with you and also uh, talk with all your listeners. So uh, yeah, my name is uh, Jim Roddy. And so um, I guess I would describe myself as a, an entrepreneur. When I was 23, I started my own uh, magazines, one of them a sports magazine for here in Northwest Pennsylvania, where I'm based. Uh, then I spent 17 years in the technology publishing industry, the last 11 president of an organization that was growing here in Pennsylvania and all throughout uh, North America. Uh, then the last few years, I've been a uh, business coach uh, focused mostly on uh, small to medium size uh, business owners, managers, leaders, and potential leaders a lot in the retail technology channel. And then along with all that, um, because I was in publishing, that kind of put me into education, that had me in writing and communication. Um, I've published two books. Uh, one was on hiring best practices called Hire Like You Just Beat Cancer. I'm a 19-year colon cancer survivor. And then my newest book that came out in 2020 is called The Walk-On Method to Career and Business Success, where we profile walk-on, former walk-on student athletes and how that experience really drove them in their professional career, not professional sports necessarily, uh, but professional like you and me uh, at a desk or working as a, a pastor or a doctor or a lawyer or anything of that nature. And this is kind of going back full circle to uh, before I started my professional career, um, I was a walk-on basketball player at Gannon University, which is a division two school uh, here in Erie, Pennsylvania, a small college uh, basketball powerhouse. So that kind of ties everything up in terms of where I started, where I am now, and going all the way back to the beginning. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, so our audience is entrepreneurs, want to be entrepreneurs, those type of individuals. So I love hearing the entrepreneurial side of it. And there's so many things that we're going to be able to touch on. But I want to specifically put some focus on the walk-on method. Um, there's some great things in there. And I love what you've put together in there. And you know what, your, your story by itself, we could spend an hour just talking about that experience and that part of the book, but do you want to just talk a little bit, I guess, to begin with the steps of the walk-on method, if you want to just touch on that and then we can go into it there. Sure. Happy to do that. Um, and just for anybody who doesn't know, cause sometimes a bump into people, they're like, what exactly is a walk-on? So that's an athlete that does not have a scholarship. Uh, at, uh, at a, you know, they play for a scholarship team, but essentially everybody else on the team has a scholarship. They're recruited. The walk on, like, literally just walks onto the team and says, I'd like to play. And then they have to try out and, and go through all that. So, um, and then the theme of the book is that ordinary people, even underdogs and maybe especially underdogs, ordinary people will accomplish extraordinary feats when their energy is properly channeled. And so the way that these walk-ons behave now as professionals is second nature because they were forced to behave that way to survive as a walk-on. So the five steps of the walk-on method, step number one is take a big shot. We say in the book, anybody can make a layup. Just don't try something easy or safe, like really go for, for what you want. And we can go into more of these, uh, more detail if you want later. And step two is make a passion statement. So with a P, not with an F, uh, a passion statement. So that means, uh, Everybody talks about, man, the person really plays with passion. But in order, before you get to that point where you play with passion, you've got to prepare and you've got to practice with passion. That's what these successful walk-ons did. That's how they made the team. That's how they stuck on the team. And that's how they become leaders and success, uh, successful folks uh, running their own businesses or whatever career path they chose. Step three is run uphill. And that's all about embracing obstacles. And we say it takes longer to make, but it makes you stronger. Oftentimes when we see a hill, like we slow slow down, we stop, people tell us, no, go another direction, take the easy path, but walk on, see that hill and they charge up it, they run up that hill and uh, they really embrace the obstacles and realize they're gonna be better uh, on the other side of it. Uh, step
step four, we call it no fuss, all must. So the fuss stands for uh, ma ma uh, control your emotions, right? Maintain emotional control at all times. Don't get too high. Don't get too low when you're going through tough times. Maintain that emotional control. And then all must, M-U-S, uh, it's an acronym. It stands for maximize your unique strengths. Instead of dwelling on the tough things you can't do or what you're going through, maximize the uni those unique strengths and be something special for your organization uh, and what you want to do. And then step number five is make them throw you out of the gym. Um, and so that what that means is never, ever, 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 ever quit, right? Too many people throw themselves out of the gym. They see this dream that they want to achieve and they go, you know what, here's all these reasons why I can't do it. They won't take me. I can't accept that. I can't start that business. I can't make that sale. It's just not in the cards for me. Who am I from small town? Or I actually just got an email on this this morning. Who am I that I don't have a formal business degree to go do and do this thing? But that's too many people throw themselves out of the gym. You keep coming back until you get what you came for. And I guess the beauty of the walk-on method is that all five steps are within your power, right? You don't need some specialized degree to make a passion statement or control your emotions or to just keep coming back for more and being relentless. So that's, I guess, my uh, two or three minutes there on, on the five steps of the walk-on method. You know, I love that. We, especially in my daily success strategies podcast, um, which I am going to take pieces of this podcast and put on there because I know you're going to hit on things that I touch on there as well. But I always am talking about how we can learn from our athletic experiences to be successful in real life. And this is really putting that into practice. But this is at a completely different level because, I mean, just from your own experience, give a little bit of your history, starting with, you know, you were the, you were the stud in high school and, <laughs> you know, you had your dream of where you wanted to play and everything. But give the experience of how difficult it is to be a walk-on. Sure. Uh, so I guess, uh, you know, so I did score a ton of points, get a ton of playing time in high school, but my high school was so small. We only had 15 kids in our graduating class, one five, not 50, right? And so we had six boys in the senior class. So playing time wasn't exactly a, a problem because we just didn't have enough people on the team. Practicing was more difficult because we, it was hard to get five on five uh, and go and go back and forth. But so I played for, you know, went to that really, really tiny school. Again, it's a K through 12 school and uh, locally again, Gannon University, you know, powerhouse, small college program. They recruit recruited a bunch of older players, like a 31 year old guy out of the steel mills in Pittsburgh, 26 year old guy out of the army. They went to the national championship for uh, division two pack the place. I mean, you're talking about like these great athletes. And I said, that's where I want to play. Like I was a big game and basketball fan growing up. And so, you know, I just realized like, well, what am I going to have to do in order to make that happen? Cause they sure as heck weren't going to recruit me. You're a big enough fan that you would give up dates to go to games, right? <laughs> it's not like there was a long list of dates, but the one that I do highlight in the book, yes, that's exactly right. Uh, that I did, you know, well, here's the thing. I prioritize basketball, you know, basketball and uh, Gannon over everything else because that was my dream. And that's one thing that happens is people try to divide all the things they want to go for. I really focused on that. But yeah, we would have a basketball game, a high school game that would overlap with a Gannon game. And I would race down my family would like after the game, I'd show up in the game in my uniform, you know, my high school uniform because I wanted to make sure uh, I got a seat. So, but I had to work up the courage to pick up the phone and say like, how do you even try out for the team? Cause there was no formal process for it. And so I did that, you know, my heart pounding, the head coach answers the phone and he just said, you know, just when school starts uh, at three o'clock at the Gannon rec center, show up and we, uh, you know, we play and then formal practice starts October 15th and we'll see what we do after a few practices there. And so, you know, to start off my walk on career, I just kept showing up for those, uh, you know, informal scrimmages. And I'd say, can I play next? And they'd say no. Right. And then the next game, I'd be like, can I play next? And they'd say no. So I'd say four out of the five uh, days of the week that I went to the, uh, the rec center, I wasn't playing at all. I was just shooting around in between games. The only time I played was when they had nine people and they needed a 10th. And they're like, OK. And even then I didn't get the ball. But, you know, I had a lot of reasons why to quit. The coach didn't know my name. Um, everybody else had practice jerseys and team 
you know, gear. I had none of that. Um, I actually had a class that overlapped the first 10 minutes of a Monday and Wednesday practice. And so I would put my gear on underneath, you know, my uh, long pants because, you know, it's always cold here and uh, in Erie, Pennsylvania. So I'd have to run from class uh, to the court. And so I just kept showing up and working my tail off. And the one thing to maximize your unique strength, I was fast. And so I knew if I tried hard in every sprint and I finished first in every sprint, the coaches would say, well, here's somebody that he might not play a lot but he could, you know, help set the pace for work ethic on our team. And then one thing I didn't realize until years later, the day after midterm grades came out and I had a pretty good GPA, I think what the head coach did was like, okay, let's factor in Jimmy Roddy. Okay. That raises me 0.12. Might as well, like that'll help. That'll help me on the team. So um, that's kind of a quick path of, of my road to become a walk-on. I wasn't asked. I wasn't, uh, they weren't honored by my presence and, you know, nobody really talked to me, but it was something that I wanted. And so, um, I was going to keep showing up every day. You know, the thing I really like about it too is, you know, it, it could be a really great Cinderella story that you're a walk on. And then, you know, by second year, you've got a scholarship. And by your final year there, you're the all star of the team. Um, you had a specific role on that team, which was even apparent when you were out for a bit. And the coach says, you know, we need that fire back. We need you back here. But, you never quit working hard. You never quit giving it all. And you never were that starter. And that's what I love about, you know, make them throw out of you, throw you out of the gym. Never, never, ever, ever, whatever, give up is you're the perfect example of that. And I think that's a hard thing for people to learn and understand. So if you just want to talk a little bit more about that and that step, well, that's, that's very kind of you uh, to say uh, with that. And so um, it was something that I really wanted. And so I just thought, well, what do I have to do in order to get it? I wasn't going to get any taller, right? Like I knew that I was only <laughs> 145 pounds and, you know, everybody else there was, you know, 180, you know, if not more than that. And I just, and, you know, folks who are watching on the video, like I'm, you know, not that big even uh, today, many years later, but I thought, what could I do. And so there was the element of just working my tail off, showing up early. So I was actually a commuter. So I didn't have my own apartment or wasn't living in the dorm or anything. So I used that as an advantage. And instead of like hanging out in my dorm and then showing up, you know, 20 minutes before practice began, like everybody else, I would go there early. I would go up to the coach's office, knock on the door and say, can I get the keys to get the the ball's out because nobody else had uh, the gym. And so I didn't do that just to be showy or once I made the team, there was a real thing of, you know, desperation. I think a lot of entrepreneurs can relate to this because I know when I was an entrepreneur um, and I always, I've always said before people enter the workforce, like a lot of organ, a lot of countries have, you have to have one year military service. I think everybody should have one year of entrepreneurial service when you don't get paid unless you make the check show up. Right. And so that's kind of what I learned, you know, from a walk on standpoint, this wasn't going to happen unless I was showing up early, unless I did it all the way through my four year career, because I knew at any point if I was relaxing on my grades or on my work ethic or on my showing up early or playing hard during practice, they'd be like, why do we really need him around? Right. That was my unique strength. So my game days, like we played games on Wednesdays and Saturdays for the most part, my game days were Sunday through Tuesday. Right. And Thursday. Uh, and Friday, and even sometimes in the shoot arounds as well to make sure that I had the pace there. So it was just a mindset um, to keep doing it and to not make uh, any excuses. It, it reminds me, so I worked for the student newspaper as well. And I one time had all this, these reports and stuff that I had to do. And I ended up staying at the newspaper office all through the night. And we actually had a 6 a.m. shoot around. Um, and so I didn't get done working until it was like 4.30 in the morning. And somebody said, well, just tell your coaches you're not going to come and you have too much homework to do. I was like, what? Like that never even crossed my mind. Like you just got to keep showing up and doing it and figure out, uh, figure out a way to do it. Uh, somebody I worked with, a uh, young person played division three sports and um, has a very much a walk on mindset. Uh, when she, her first day on the job, she hung up on her marker board or on her cork board FIO. And I'm like, what does that mean? And she said, figure it out. That's what her head coach would always tell her, figure it out. And so that's kind of the approach that I took. And it was just figure it out. And again, that's what I call in the book, you know, the never, ever, ever, ever quit. Um, just keep showing up, keep doing it, keep attacking what you need to do, keep practicing, keep preparing far more than the average person would. And, and things will, things will play out for you. I'm not sure when, but at some point they'll play out for you. 
right? And I guess one of the things I'm interested in is, you know, I coach and talk a lot about mindset. And for someone in this situation, I guess one of the things is you you had your expectations, you knew what to expect and you knew what you were willing to do. But, you know, even with the story of the newspaper, it would have been very easy to say, you know what, even if they bench me this weekend, I probably, I'm probably not playing anyways. So <laughs> I wouldn't know the difference if they had, been. Yeah. <laughs> maybe they did. I just didn't, they never told me, but yeah, it kind of felt like it for four years. So how does somebody, whether it's in athletics, whether it's in business, whatever they're doing, develop that mindset that says, you know what, even though I know I'm not going to be playing on Friday, no, I'm, I'm going to be there. I'm going to show up, give it a hundred percent and do my part. Yeah, so that's a really good question. And one thing is I was doing all the interviews for the book. So we end up profiling 30 walk-ons who became successful. Again, many of them are entrepreneurs. Some of them went more down the, uh, you know, a technical uh, path. And one thing I learned after doing, it was probably seven or eight interviews in, where I'm a big fan and a student of, uh, of servant leadership. And I realized that's exactly what this is. Like this is, I want to say the ultimate, but it's pretty close to the ultimate servant leadership where you are showing up and saying, what can I do to make that person better? What can I do to make that person feel better? What can I do to help the coaches achieve their goals? Because you sure aren't, you know, aren't there for yourself and your own stat sheets, right? Um, uh, one of the walk-ons I profiled of the book, his name is Nick Berardini, um, and he's now a uh, documentary um, film producer. And uh, he played at the University of Missouri basketball uh, walk-on. And he said, if you're only in it, for those moments of warming up against Kansas or the couple times you're going to get on the court, it's not going to sustain you through the difficult times. Like you really have to have it in your heart in terms of this is what I want to do, not just for myself, but for other people. Like this is really a way for me to serve other people, make them better, make a, making a lasting impression, um, on them. And that was, again, a driving force, not just for me, but it really seems like for a lot of those walk-ons in the book. Now, some of them did end up getting a scholarship and some of the football guys did play uh, in the NFL, but it really starts with the whole thing of, I believe that I can do something here. I believe that I can stand out. I believe that I can do something that's going to lift this team. And if that drives you, great. If you take more of a it only matters in the stat sheet. I always talk about like a microwave society. I need instant gratification in 60 seconds. If that's what you're looking for, it's not going to happen. And it's just like going into business. If you want to start a business and you're like, I want to be a millionaire in a year. Yeah, you're probably, you know, if you're in it for the money, you're probably in it for the wrong reasons. Right. Well, that's great. Thank you. Now, something you talked about there that just kind of, I want to expand on, whether you're looking at it from, a team perspective or an individual perspective. And you talk about this in your chapter from a team perspective. How do you build confidence? Uh, great question. And I can say now that I am uh, 51 years old, um, you know, working with folks who are half my age and oftentimes they don't have uh, the confidence uh, that they need. And so the way that I feel that you build confidence is by putting in the work, right? So I was not a, you know, professional speaker by trade, right? Like I was a communications English major, but I was more on the writing path, but I wanted to do some speaking. Um, I also did some radio broadcasting as well. So it wasn't just like, well, let's show up and cross my fingers. It was put in the work. It was study. What do other people do? What other books can I read? What are some of the best practices? How can I build that and put that together? How can I practice, 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 practice in order to do that? If you put in the work, like truly put in the work. My first uh, basketball coach at Gannon, Tom Chapman, he coached at Gannon. Uh, my freshman year was his last year. He ended up then getting the job at, at St. Bonaventure. He would always talk about give two efforts, like not just one, I did it, like I should get the goal. Give that full second true effort. And if you put in the work and you do more work than anybody else and more practice than anybody else and you've worked hard and you've worked smart, you deserve the confidence to do it, right? Like just like somebody shooting a free throw. Right. If you're not very good at free throws, but if you have for the past two years put in an hour a day doing that work, 
you should be confident. Uh, there was a guy who played at Gannon well after me. His name was Steve Moyer. He set the Division II record uh, for three-pointers made. And actually, the All-Divisions record, he held on to that for a few years. Well, I remember they had a shooting chart up that they would have at practice. Everybody's required to shoot 100 three-pointers a day. All right? Steve Moyer, every day charted out, he shot 500 three-pointers a day. That kid deserved to have the three-point record, right? Because he was the one putting in the work. So you can't just say, oh, I want to be confident. Let me psych myself up. I'm going to dress well and look the part. If you put in the work, you deserve to be confident. And again, that really ties in with that second step of the, of the walk-on method about really preparing and practicing with passion. Then you're going to be able to play with passion. You'll be able to play with confidence. But it all starts in that preparation when nobody's watching. Uh, that just reminds me, I, I had my kids one year at a Michael Jordan camp and they were talking uh, about free throws and someone asked him, how many free throws should I be taking a day? And he said, however many it takes that any time, whether it's a nothing game or a championship game with no time on the clock, when you walk up, it's just another shot that you know you've made a million times and you're going to make it mm -hmm. and put in the work. Absolutely. I when that. I coached, so I uh, started coaching a fifth and sixth grade basketball. I did that in my, I guess it was my mid twenties. Uh, and we had one thing in practice because we wanted the kids to practice defensive slides. So they would practice their slides. Then I'd throw the ball to one kid and he would dribble down and make a layup. And so I'd say like 10 seconds against St. Luke's. So-and-so gets the steals. He dribbles in. Timeout. St. Luke's. We're up by one point. Right. And then everybody'd be like, all right, we have 30 seconds. We have to slide really hard. And so the kids would really slide. Our fourth game. So we did that all the practices. Our fourth game of the year. Guess what happens against St. Luke's? We score with like 17 seconds left. We have to get one stop. And I remember saying to the kids, we've done this every day. And they're like, yeah. I remember them getting up and the assistant coach saying to me, They've never done this before, but dang it, they went out there like <laughs> believing we've done this so many times. And sure enough, they got the stop. They actually did it a couple of times later that year, but they built up the confidence because they had put in that work uh, in advance. There's no shortcuts to success in athletics uh, or in business. You just, you got to put in the work. Excellent. Talk about how step number three, run uphill. How does that apply to entrepreneurship? Sure. So I'll, I'll tell you first where it came from. So I was more, uh, a distance runner uh, when I was younger. So running in like cross country races and stuff like that. So everybody, when they got to a hill, they would slow down and kind of trudge up the hill. And for whatever reason, I got it in my mind, like, well, what if every time I got to a hill, I would sprint up the hill? And so one, it advanced me further in the race. And then it just totally psyched out the people I was passing. Like nobody passes anybody on an uphill and they're like, who is this psycho? <laughs> you know, what's, what's going on with him? So that's where the, the derivation of, of run uphill uh, comes from. So we're taught to avoid obstacles and seek the path of least resistance. And so what we learned from these walk-ons, they didn't avoid obstacles, right? They could have very well played on the intramural team. They could have gone to a lesser school where they could have had more playing time, but they leaned into the difficulties of the situation and they actually embraced those obstacles and looked for them and looked for things that were more difficult because they knew on the other end of the experience that they were going to end up being battle tested. So, you know, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, I'll give you an example of Chris Doring. And so he uh, was a three sport athlete in high school in Gainesville, Florida, you know, basketball, baseball, football. He was also the lead in the musical theater production. He's like, he said he had the greatest senior year in the history of all senior years. Well, the school where he wanted to play was his hometown, Florida Gators. They had no interest in him whatsoever. So he walked on there. This is before I get to the entrepreneurial part of it. So he walked on there, ended up earning playing time, earning a scholarship. Not only that, he ended up playing in the NFL down the road. Well, after eight years in the NFL, like, what are you going to do? And so he had somebody who said, I recommend the mortgage industry. He joined the mortgage industry in 2007, just in time for the Great Recession of 2008, right? And so talk about somebody who could have been like, okay, I'm not going to do that. Let me find something easier. He said, well, maybe this is the time for me to really learn what it's about. And look at my background. I've always done the hard thing. I'm going to do it again. So he didn't just run up a hill. Like he was scaled, sprinted up a mountain in bare feet. And so he fought through that crisis, built up his own business. And he said he learned to block out the distractions on the periphery and really focus on what he wanted. So, you know, there were all sorts of reasons for him to go through that financial crisis to say, here's why this shouldn't work. There's been a reason for entrepreneurs in 2020 and stretching into 2021 to point to 
here's here's why this, here's why this, here's why this. Like I talked to a lot of business owners and too many of them say, the governor this, the governor that. Well, there are other people in your situation who are succeeding. You've got to, like Chris said, block out those distractions on the periphery. Um, another person we featured, Megan Lightfoot, who's a rower, she said, keep your head in the boat, right? Forget about the blisters on your hands. Forget about the salt water in your face. Forget that the other boat is way far ahead. Just keep your head in the boat and keep working on those things and, and really play the long game. So that's why I'd say entrepreneurs are oftentimes on their own and struggling and thinking about here's all the tough and difficult things. But if you focus on that, boy, what can I do in order to learn from this experience and find my own niche and keep moving forward? That's where it seems like business owners, again, the ones that I work with, the entrepreneurs that I work with, those are the folks instead of slowing down, they figure out where's the opportunity for me uh, in all this, uh, all this difficulty that's going on. Well, I think that from your own entrepreneurial experience as well, um, there's a lot of reasons you shouldn't have started a magazine <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, looking at who your competition was and, but you found what they weren't doing and found that niche and were able to really do your own thing. So I, I think that's really cool. It's more Actually, than just talking the talk, you're walking the walk. I said to my wife yesterday, cause I was writing a check for, you know, my, uh, my book business. And so I looked at the, uh, the, you know, total in there and I said, I have $1,000 more in this checking account than I did in my entire savings and checking account when I started my own business when I was 23. Like, how crazy was that, right, to move forward uh, with that? And again, I'm not sitting on a, uh, a six-figure uh, bank account uh, at this point, uh, you know, from the, the book standpoint by any means. But yeah, that's what you got to do. You just really got to go for it and take that big shot and, and keep moving forward, keep adjusting. Talk about... And again, relating it to entrepreneurship, um, maximizing your unique strengths, you know, as we look at step four. Sure. And it, it, so it's, uh, you know, no fuss, all must. So um, control your emotions and then maximize your unique strengths. So a lot of the walk-ons that we profiled in the book, they were shorter, skinnier, slower than all these other gifted scholarship athletes. But they figured out the special ability or the attitude that they had and then maximize the benefit for the whole. So I'll give you an example. And this is through an entrepreneur who's become ultra successful. So his name is Brandon Landry. He's featured in chapter seven of the book. And so he is the co-founder, co-owner and CEO of Walk On Sports Bistro. So it's a fast growing restaurant uh, in the Southeast. And say folks in the Southeast are probably nodding their head. People in other parts of the country are like, I'm not sure if I ever heard of them, but Drew Brees is actually now a part owner. And so um, when uh, Brandon was a walk on on the basketball team at LSU, you, he and another uh, walk-on athlete um, were traveling with the team and they're like, man, we don't have good rest. Like the good restaurants we eat at on the road, we don't have any of those here back in, in Baton Rouge. And so they decided to go and, and launch that. Now, the way that Brandon made the team was he, was he was an okay high school athlete, but he worked up the courage to go knock on the door of the brand new head coach and say, I would like to try out. He tried out. He got cut. He could have said, I guess it's not in the cards for me. His reaction was, I've got to work harder. I've got to play more. I've got to get stronger. I have to do the things I need to do to make this team. So my second basketball coach at Gannon, Bob Duquette, who came from Marquette, he would always say, point the thumb, not the finger. And I just think Brandon is a great example of pointing the thumb to say, what can I do better? So he did get better. He did get stronger. And sure enough, he got the call back because they had some injuries. They said, we'd like you as a practice player, but we need you here at 6.30 a.m., right? How many people say, is there a 6.30 a.m.? Well, guess what he did? He got there at 5.30 a.m. And then he got his butt kicked in practice every day. And so instead of saying, well, I guess I'm in the wrong place, he once again said, what do I need to do to get stronger? What do I need to do to get better. And so that's kind of how the walk-on and the walk-on mentality and the walk-on attitude sparked his walk-ons restaurant. The first bank they went to said, no, you're crazy. The second bank, the third bank, he got turned down by six banks. And when I interviewed him, I asked him, what if that seventh bank would have turned you down? He says, I guess I'd have gone to the eighth bank, right? And so he figured out that his persistence, right? His willingness to keep going, keep going, keep going. That was his unique strength. And so every entrepreneur has in them a personality trait or a product strength or some uh, particular value that they're adding um, that they can really make sure that they maximize that the big boys really can't do. Like maybe the big boys can't pivot as quickly as you do. So why don't you pivot and go find 
that opportunity. So to me, he's one example of somebody who really found what does he do well? Keep coming back, keep coming back, keep pressing. And he's grown walk-ons into, I think they just celebrated, I'm going to get the number wrong, their 50th franchise and they just continue to spread out. So if you haven't heard of walk-ons now, I think you're going to hear about them uh, very soon. And that's because Brandon Landry, former walk-on, is just all maximizing his unique strength and that, uh, that chain, that franchise is an extension of him. So we've already reached our normal time limit, but this is going to be a longer episode because I'm not done. So I hope you're not. <laughs> um, what I'd love to hear, you, you mentioned the walk-on attitude. And one of the questions I have is, you know, whether you're an athlete, an entrepreneur, whatever, everyone's got their own limiting beliefs. So someone with a walk-on attitude, how do they deal with their limiting beliefs and overcome those limiting beliefs that they have in their own heads? Uh, gr great question. So I guess it's first with the belief. And like I said earlier, ordinary people will accomplish extraordinary feats if their energy is properly channeled. Right. And so you can't say, well, here are my circumstances and like my feet are set in concrete. I'm not going to be able to go anywhere. I can't do anything. I can't change anything. You have to say, where can I channel my energy in order to get better in the areas that I need to? Right. And so if you say this is the goal that I want to have, you sit down and say, what are the path in order for me to get there? What work do I need to do in order to uh, accomplish that? So it start with, you know, there's the fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. So fix says I am the way that I am. The growth mindset says, well, I can change. I can improve. There are certain things I can do. Now, obviously, you can't get yourself, you know. You can't be taller. It takes a long time to get stronger uh, in that regard. And everybody has, you know, some certain uh, limits uh, to what they have. But just being able to say, what is that? Is that something that I could actually accomplish? What work do I need to get there? And just keep working. Just keep showing up every single day, right? The only way that you hollow out a rock, you know, is one drip at a time. So just keep dripping and just keep doing that until you get uh, what you came for. But it starts with that belief that, you know, you're not inferior that if you properly channel your energy, that you can accomplish uh, something uh, extraordinary. Excellent. Um, th this has been great. Um, I really enjoyed talking to you about uh, this subject and the things that you're sharing with us. And I will make sure in the show notes, I'm going to leave the links to your books and any of your links that you share with us. But that's one thing I want you to do is share with our listeners how they find you, how they follow you, Again, repeat both the name of both books and just anything you want to share. Sure. Yeah. The first book is Hire Like You Just Beat Cancer, H-I-R-E. Uh, and it's all about hiring best practices. And I'll tell you what, I published that book a long time ago. Um, if anybody who's listening to this wants a digital copy of that book, I'm more than happy to email it to them. Just email me at jim, J-I-M, at Jim Roddy, C-B-A, J-I-M-R-O-D-D-Y, C-B-A, just like backwards ABC, uh, dot com. Just mentioned uh, the, the Jeff and Heidi show, and I'm more than happy to send an electronic copy of of that to you, that book. Um, now, I'm not as generous with the walk-on method. You actually would have to buy that uh, on Amazon. Uh, and so you can just find that uh, on uh, on Amazon. If folks want to uh, connect directly with me, you can find me on Twitter, Jim underscore Roddy. And LinkedIn is probably the best way uh, for folks to connect. Um, and so you can find me there um, if you just search for uh, Jim Roddy. Um, there's not too many of us, uh, of us around. So um, yeah, those are the best ways. And, you know, more than happy to talk with folks. I'm, as you can tell, I'm really passionate about sharing this message, especially with young professionals, uh, you, people who are just entering the workforce or just considering launching their own business, because too many times they read in, you know, a magazine or see on a website, somebody who's famous, and it seems like, oh, they're a genius, right? They just got lucky. There's this lightning strike. I could never do that. And that's why I was so passionate about this book is like, this is the path to career and business and success. It's these building blocks. It's these day-to-day -day things. And you too can achieve the success that you want, again, if you properly channel that energy. So I'm always happy to talk with folks about that uh, and share any resources that I have in order to help folks uh, move forward. Thank you. And, and thanks for that free offer on, on your first book. But I strongly suggest to all of you listening to get on the show notes, find the Amazon link and get the walk-on method. It's got some amazing stuff in there and the stories are just, they're fun and incredible to read through. 
But Jim, thanks for being with us today. I really appreciate it. I appreciate your insight and everything you've shared with us. Jeff, thanks for having me. Always a pleasure to talk with you. You bet. See ya.